Hi there! Have you ever wondered how far a coffee bean has to travel before it reaches your local Starbucks? Or how a coffee bean actually grows? Well, grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and let's go investigate together. Let's start our journey by asking the question, where in the world does coffee come from? Starbucks sources its coffee along the coffee belt. This belt stretches from the Tropic of Cancer all the way down to the Tropic of Capricorn. Along the belt, there are three main growing regions, and each of these regions may have a distinct flavor in their coffee. Let's take a closer look at each of these regions. Our first region is Latin America. Latin American coffees tend to have a cocoa taste or a nutty taste. And due to the fact that during processing, the beans are fully washed, this allows them to have a nice, bright, clean, crisp acidity to them. Let's head over to our second region, Africa and Arabia. Coffees in this region are known for their florally and fruity flavors. And this actually connects to the landscape of the region with the wide open plains and berry bushes. Let's head over to our third region, Asia and Pacific. This large region has a variety of topographies, which allow the coffees to have spicy and earthy flavors to them. The coffees are also known for their full body. And during processing, the beans are semi-washed, which leads to their balanced acidity. As you can see, based on where the coffee beans come from, we can get different flavors, bodies, and acidities in our coffee. But I wonder, how much coffee does Starbucks export from these locations in a year? These numbers can be quite impressive. Let's put these numbers into perspective. One coffee tree produces one pound of coffee a year. And if you were to drink a tall size coffee each day for one full year, you would need nine coffee trees just for you. Now that we know about the different types of flavors that each region can produce, why don't we look at the different types of beans that each region can produce? When it comes to growing coffee, altitude is key. Most people know about two types of coffee beans, Arabica and Robusta. Starbucks exclusively buys Arabica beans. Let me tell you why. Arabica beans grow at a higher altitude, where the temperature is lower. The plants are able to produce a premium dense bean that will lead to a coffee with a refined flavor, elegant body, and acidity. Let's follow the journey that a bean takes from the farm to your cup. Shortly after harvest, a green bean, like this one, is planted to start the next generation of coffee trees. These new plants will spend the first year of their life in a nursery under close supervision of a coffee farmer. After germination, these new plants start to emerge from the ground. Due to their physical appearance, they're often referred to as a matchstick or a soldier. After about two months, the helmet splits into two leaves which start the photosynthetic process. After about four months, the plant produces its first branches. At this point, plants are inspected for plant size, leaf color, plant structure, and distance between branches. Any plant that doesn't meet the specification is discarded from the nursery. After about a year, these plants have finally produced dark green foliage and a healthy root system. The plants are now ready to be transplanted into the field. They won't be ready for their first commercial harvest for another three to four years. Coffee trees typically blossom once a year, and after this flowering period, a cluster of green cherries can be found. It won't be until nine months later that these cherries will be deep, red in color, and ready for harvest. Let's take a closer look at the harvesting of these coffee beans. But first, let's look at when coffee beans are harvested. Based on their geographic location, each region will have a different ideal growing season, and this will dictate when the beans are ready for harvest.
you'll notice that both Kenya and Indonesia have two harvesting seasons, and this is because both regions span the equator. Now that the cherries have been harvested, they're ready for processing. Depending on which processing method is applied to them, the bean can take on different types of properties, leading to different flavors, bodies, and acidities. Wash processing involves six steps. The first step has the cherries sent to a wet mill. At the wet mill, depulpers physically remove the pulp from the beans. The beans are then held in a fermentation tank for 18 to 36 hours where they'll gain some of their body, flavor, and acidity. After a final washing, the beans are placed on an outdoor patio where they're allowed to dry for 5 to 7 days. The beans are then moved to a warehouse for the next 2 months where they continue to develop flavor. At this point, the parchments are removed and the green beans are sent on to a roastery. Semi-wash processing is a bit different. It involves 7 steps, and the first 3 occur while the cherries are still on the farm. In the first step, the cherries are washed and depulped using the hand-cranked machines. The beans are then soaked in buckets of water for 1-2 to two hours. At the end of this, they're rubbed together to remove any mucilage. It's not uncommon to find some beans with some fruit still attached to them. It just contributes to some of the flavor. The beans are then re-rinsed and laid out to remove any excess moisture. The beans are then shipped to a mill, where they're allowed to continue to dry for 1-5 to five days depending on the weather. They're then hauled to remove any parchments and mucilage from the beans. At this point they return to the patios to fully dry before they're shipped to a roastery. With the natural processing, the cherries are taken directly to a processing location. At this location, the cherries are laid out and allowed to dry. After several days, the skin becomes thick, almost resembling a raisin, and the cherries are then ready to be shipped to a hauling station. Hauling will remove the pulp, mucilage, and parchment all in one step. The green bean is now laid out for further drying before it's bagged, ready for shipment. As you can imagine, the different processing methods can lead to different flavors in the coffee. The fermentation step in the wash processing can lead to an acidic flavor, whereas the partial drying of the semi-washed can lead to a more herbal and earthy flavor. And the fact that the whole cherry is dried during the natural processing leads to a fruity flavor. The green beans will eventually make their way to one of the five Starbucks roasteries, like this one here, on Pike Street in Seattle, Washington. Once the green beans are at the roastery, their inherent flavor characteristics cannot be improved, but they can be ruined very quickly. It's the job of the master roaster to guide the beans along the roasting process. Each coffee requires different roasting conditions. It's the job of the master roaster to balance the heat, time, temperature and moisture inside the roaster. A signature popping sound indicates the release of coffee oil. This is the coffee oil. Too much heat and this oil will burn. Too little heat and this oil will never be released. As we can see here, the roasting process causes the green beans to expand in size. Here's some freshly roasted coffee. Each batch roasts approximately 100 pounds of coffee. The coffee is now ready to be packaged and shipped to our stores. Starbucks offers a variety of different roasts. Now that you know the whole process of how we get our coffee, why not try a new roast today?